Welcome back into The Mental Game, where this week's guest is comedian Chloe Radcliffe. It took me a long, long, long time to be able to be willing to say some of the like darkest, most dangerous stuff. Right. I have people come up to me and be like, holy shit, I didn't know anybody else felt like that. And you said everything that's on the inside of my brain. And in this episode, Chloe opens up about her stand up career where she is chasing her dream in comedy, touring all over the country. But she also talks about her own mental health struggles, being bullied as a kid for her birthmark, her mother's support through those challenging years, but now using that vulnerability on stage, all of that and so much more in this amazing interview. But first, I want to tell you about man therapy. And guys, I am talking to you because look, We have to be comfortable being vulnerable about our mental health, and that's why I want you to go to mantherapy.org today. But now it is time for the latest episode here on The Mental Game with Chloe Radcliffe. Welcome back into the mental game. As you can see sitting next to me, I have a very special, very funny guest, not Chloe Badcliffe, as your Instagram says. <laughs> Chloe Radcliffe, thanks so much for coming on the mental game. Hell yeah, thank you for having me. You have the uh, orange, we're in Cincinnati right now, for those of you that are watching. <laughs> I wasn't, I packed orange fans and I was not trying to, I, I, I landed and was like, ah, I brought the only pair of orange pants that I own to the Bengal city. Anyway, it's, it's perfect. And you have a red shirt. We're sitting next to you. You guys can't see it. We're actually just at uh, Ken Griffey Jr.'s crotch in this mural. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. it's a perfect frame for us. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I got to go to your show two nights ago. Fucking hilarious. Thank you. Um, talked a lot about, you know, your own story, kind of some vulnerable moments in your life. Also, just making fun of people in the crowd, which I love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I caught a little bit of it, but not as much as others. Yeah, 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 yeah. I w- well, what, I, when I saw you, at first I was- I know, I didn't tell you it was where- like, I, I, I wasn't clocking exactly where you were in the room. And so it took my brain like a second to like track exactly what was going on. And then when I, when I realized it was you, I was like, oh, I'm not going to fuck with you. <laughs> it would have been so funny for you to like call me a piece of shit yeah, and then yeah, do yeah. a podcast the next yeah. day. <laughs> um, oh my, yeah, that would have been hilarious. But you're based in New York from Minnesota. Comedy, we were talking before, you were working at- Target before doing comedy. Yes. Doing Target corporate. Nothing Headquarters. Ag- nothing against like bagging groceries or anything like yeah, that yeah, or working yeah. in the uh, tech department. But comedy is obviously your passion now. You've really taken social media by storm. It's been cool to watch. We connected maybe like six months ago. Yeah. Um, but I want to go through your whole story, mental health journey, and obviously the comedy of it. But the first thing I ask everyone is what does mental health mean to you? And you were struggling when I gave you the... Uh, <laughs> Everyone the does. It's, it, I gave you the prompt. It's the only question that I tell people we're going to ask, but it's very unique. Like for me, mental health is loving yourself, finding the best version of yourself. But I ask you the same thing. What does it mean to you? Um, okay. To me, I think that mental health is uh, being in a position where I am able to access a creative flow state mm. sort of at will or like more easily than more difficult if that if that makes sense so like i need to be able to lock into right brain flow state whatever the right word is you know yeah to write to like to write a script to write a joke to write a what whatever to um to think strategically about even like career strategy i want to be in that like flow state so that i can have sort of a like 360 degree view of what projects need to be going when and what do I need to be working on and where do I need to be putting the gas and who do I need to be talking to now about something small so that late in a year I can talk to them about something big, whatever, all that kind of stuff. And when I am really paralyzed in mental health, like when I am not in a healthy good mental health, mental state, um, I just, I feel like, uh, I, I, I feel like the gears just go like, get, Kick, 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 you know, like, and they, yeah. and they like never actually turn into that, into right. that like flywheel uh-huh. turning. Um, and that, so, so to me, it's like being, being able to access that 
And waking up in the morning and not just immediately getting into that. Like, I feel like I feel like when I'm not in a mental health state, it's like uh, my brain is like a Roomba that ran into a wall okay, and just like yeah. keeps running into the wall right. over, and over, and over and over and over and over and over. Right. And then it's not it's it's not even actually like I've never been actively suicidal. I've never I've never been clinically depressed. I think that like. Uh, my, my, my sweet, wonderful boyfriend would be like, you definitely have anxiety. I've never been diagnosed <laughs> with anxiety. I'm fine. <laughs> um, but like, so I don't even, I guess the Roomba metaphor to me is also representative that like, I don't feel like my bad mental health is sometimes I'm like really bad and really spirally and really panicky. But for the most part, it's just, it's like low level bad, but just not helpful yeah. at all. Not going anywhere. It's not. It's also not like destroying anything, but it's not useful. Yeah. Well, it's it's not destroying anything, and it's not fun. Not, well, no, none of it's fun. As someone that's dealt with all that crazy yeah, yeah. shit, it is not fun. I, I'm gonna shorter your answer here. Present is kind of what I heard there. It's like you want to be present in every moment and make that moment or make those moments count. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm not a therapist. I'm just like trying to read the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You're totally right. I guess to me, there's like, there's a break of, I, I want to be present. Mental health to me kind of splits into two avenues. There's one, I want to be present uh, and enjoy whether it's comedy, whether it's people, you know, being, being with people I love, whether it's yeah. being in a new city, Cincinnati is secretly so awesome. Hell yeah. Let's um, go. <laughs> uh, or whether it's being I guess it's like when I'm talking about the flow state, it's not just it, present as part of it, but it's like being able to see a system level and that when I am in a bad mental health state, I can only see, it's like, see, I want to be able to see the forest and when right. I'm in bad brains, I can only see the trees. Smart. I get it. It's like you have this tunnel vision. You know, I always tell people, you know, feelings are temporary and in those moments you think those feelings are, it's the end of the world. That's all you yeah, can yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. So now I get it. Um, and I, I love this from your show and you, I hear it from throughout that answer. You are so good at storytelling Thank and you. like the way that you, I don't know, shape stuff. I mean, even that answer about mental health, you're telling a story with the forest or whatever you're saying or before. Or the Roomba or yeah, whatever the, Roomba. the fuck. <laughs> I'm going to be, I mean, what is a Roomba? A Roomba? Yeah. I'm gonna, I almost just held it in. I'm like, Wow. Okay. What do you think a Roomba is? Based on based on the <laughs> <laughs> based on the images that I've given you, I the information like, that you I'm have. I'm going like, is she talking about like a car driving into the wall? Is she talking about like a workout thing? I don't I have no fucking idea what it is. G guess. I'm so this is this so is, exciting I'm gonna, to I'm, me. I'm gonna edit this out. No, I'm kidding. I'll keep <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep it in. Um He doesn't know what a fucking Roomba is. You know what a Roomba is. <laughs> this is gonna go bad. <laughs> I guess my first my first instinct went to like some type of workout machine or like a roller or it's not a bad guess. A Roomba is one of those little um it's like one of the robot vacuums. Oh, okay. You know, like the little the yeah, little okay. circles that go around. Why don't you vacuum? just say it's a fucking ro a robot vacuum? Would you do you call a Kleenex a facial tissue? N no, okay, <laughs> fair enough. Damn it. <laughs> I'm scared of those things. They give me anxiety. You don't it's know. Kleenexes? Yeah, I know. No, well, that, that too. What, so, uh, yeah. I should have never fucking admitted yes. that. All right. We're off. Do, the lesson of this podcast is do not admit your weakness. Yeah, exactly. Never be vulnerable <laughs> with a comedian. I'm learning. Uh, but you can be as vulnerable as you want with me. Great, I want to hear about you. all your deepest, darkest thank secrets. Thank you. Yeah, you're not going to give me shit. You're not a comedian. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. See, that's the thing, though, is I have such like a weird, dark sense of humor that my buddies are like, one, how did you never cuss or say something bad on TV? And two, like, you should try stand-up. I'm like, no, because you can't be the mental health guy and then call somebody a fucking bitch like, yeah, yeah, yeah. at the same time and have that. I will say, you can be the, the most incredible stand-ups. The, the most incredible crowd work I've ever seen is when somebody handles an asshole without being an asshole back mm. and, like, still nails it. There's a comedian named Ryan Hamilton who I saw – year I opened for years and years ago in Minneapolis, and he's so funny. He has Netflix specials, and he – I've, like, watched him crowd work. And he grew up Mormon, and I've oh, watched wow. him crowd, pe crowd work people who are being mean to him in, like, the sweetest but still most piercing way. Yeah. Anyway, so. Do they just soak you it You don't in? have to call people a bitch. That's the lesson. Thank the you. Take away. That's the All right. Take away. I, uh, yeah, I just, I, I think it's so funny the way that I, comedy is a safe space to me. Like it's not the same as therapy, obviously, Yeah. yeah. but 
I think for comedians, it is kind of their sense of therapy. You guys can work on your stuff, just like a songwriter writing music. Yeah. Um, but like anything in comedy goes. It seems like now it's getting back to that. Like the Tom Brady roast, watching Tony Hinchcliffe and Nikki Glaser, the way they worked the room in those, and everyone else did great too. But do you feel like comedy's like getting back? And I'm not exactly sure when you started. I want to get into that in a yeah, sec. Yeah. But do you feel like it's getting back to just being whatever the fuck goes, as long as it's a joke? Um, I think that there is absolutely a backlash to. I think that like the kind of um, the like policing of opinions from you know from the woke from the pc from the left whatever <laughs> like probably went too far like i think that there was a lot of like purity testing yeah. and there was a lot of lack of sense of humor like there were a lot of humorless people who were cr critiquing comedy right but i think that the backlash uh is uh, much more extreme than it needs to be and i think that a lot of people who are like i can't say anything anymore are the people who are selling theaters and stadiums and it's like yeah you fucking can shut the fuck up yeah yeah you can say whatever the fuck you want you sell an insane amount of tickets and if people are saying i think in most cases rightly so like hey the words you're saying like not not just like the slur words that you're saying though those too but like <laughs> the, the 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 like perspectives that you're forwarding actively put people in danger yes. to me that's the like that's the line it's yes. like i don't care like i don't love calling somebody a bitch but if somebody else calls somebody a bitch, what am I going to, I'm like, honestly, I could make the argument that that actually actively puts people in danger because like, ultimately that is a misogynistic term that is associating weakness with femininity. That's a whole, but like nobody fucking wants to hear that. Right. But the problem is the people who don't want to hear it are the people who are not in danger because of that. The people whose lives are never affected by that. And so that, so I think that like, there is a, a very, I think that to to just say like we can't say anything anymore is like wrong. Right. Yes, you can. And uh incredibly narrow minded and sort of undermines when people are like, it's just a joke. It's like, well then why do you care so much about being able to say it? Why not just say a different joke if it's just a joke? You're giving both sides of that argument in the same answer. The tell me. What? I mean like you're just it's You mean like am I I'm saying you're saying I, I I don't know what you're saying. Should we just start over? No, I'm kidding. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, but you're like, people get offended, but then they're yelling about or getting mad at somebody for telling the joke, but then they're not really the target of the joke. And the people, it's like the people that are getting mad aren't even the one that should be getting mad. I basically, I think that. I'm saying it in a good way. Like yeah, okay, you're playing both you. sides. I, I think I like, my opinion is basically most situations are more nuanced than the internet has capacity yes, to handle. Correct. And like PC stuff, cancel culture, whatever in comedy, <laughs> which is just nobody's ever fucking canceled. Everybody like uh, Bill Cosby t finished his tour uh, when he got out. He, uh, no, not when he got out, but like after like All when the allegations. the allegations are coming out, Jesus. he stayed on tour. Nobody, people aren't fucking canceled. Anyway, this is my, <laughs> this, it's <laughs> so insane when people act as if they've been victimized because it's like, no, you fucking haven't. You're still selling so many tickets. Shut the fuck up. You're fucking fine. Anyway. This is your therapy session. It this is my like. therapy. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Uh, I do want to. Now I'm going like. <laughs> usually I start with like people's story, how they found <laughs> comedy. We're just going right into it. I think. I don't know. Again, not your therapist, not a therapist at all. Yeah, yeah. But you talking about the way people can get canceled and sell these tickets, or like the Bill Cosby example, and these bigger comedians that maybe can say more than yeah, maybe what you can get away with just because of where you're climbing. I mean, you you. It's not even can say more. It's uh. Say things that I fundamentally think are harmful. Ah. And they don't think are harmful, and they are not the people who are being harmed by the implication. And then they get mad that they that somebody was like, hey, what you're saying might long term be harmful. And they're like, shut the fuck up, don't tell me what to say. Ah, uh, okay. And now I, I, yeah. I get that perspective. To me, it's also like if it's just a joke, then why do you feel so strongly about being able to say it? Right. You're kind of proving yourself wrong there that it's not just a joke, that it actually does have impact. Yeah. Like you're actually kind of proving the, the like, hey, that might be harmful argument of there is weight to what you're saying. This is super random, but like my manager, EJ, 
is a gay married man and we've worked together for almost a year and a half now. And it's just like our perspective, whether it's comedy, politics, life in general, it's kind of like that where I'm a straight guy, he's a gay guy. And we just kind of compare like lives and what yeah. people find offensive, our stories. That's different than comedy, but it just kind of registered and in my I, brain. And it drives me nuts when people get offended like, I think that the, the amount of nuance should apply to the other side too, right? Like, I think when somebody just sort of like, like there are audiences where if the topic of race comes up or if the topic of, of queerness comes up or whatever, insert any, any hot button issue. Yeah. Where like the audience tenses up and it's like, well, that is also the wrong Correct. reaction because A, A, it's like we should be able to discuss all of these issues. B... You're, the the attitude of like taking offense because a delicate subject is up is is harming you guys as well. Like yeah. I don't know, it's it, that's an, a very annoying perspective. Mm -hmm. I think when somebody is like arbitrarily, when somebody is automatically offended by no matter what it is this list of topics. Yes. Yeah, no matter what it is, short of you know somebody be said the most humorless person being like. And we accept all whatever, you know, like short of the most PC perspective. Um, it, it, it's all it's all annoying to me. But to me, the question is like, is this potentially harmful? Does this put someone in danger? Right. Ultimately, down the line, that is that's my that's the line. That's my line. All right. So if you missed <laughs> Just anything, a fun quirk about me. <laughs> yeah. The, the last seven and a half minutes, we have defined what is OK in comedy today. Yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I do want to get into your story because I, you were telling me before off camera that you were kind of living a normal life, as people like to say, yeah. working in corporate America at Target headquarters. But when did like comedy, I know I'm not going to ask the fucking question that everyone asks you. When did you know you were funny? Um, but like, where did comedy come in? Did you like see somebody performing when you were younger or see it like on TV? Like, where did, where did you find that love for comedy? I, um, I remember watching a Comedy Central special. I have no idea who it was. You could like, there is no way for me to figure out who yeah. this was. I don't remember this. Bill guy's. Cosby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry. And I was like, Sorry. that's what I want to do. Sorry. Um, no, I this. It was just like it was a a white guy in his late thirties, early forties. I don't remember his face clearly enough to like even recognize it. Yeah. But I remember watching it as a teenager, and and the comedy was just so not relatable to me. And I was like, that is what stand-up is. And I remember explicitly thinking in high school, being like, could I do stand-up? No, I think I'm funny, but not in that way. Had that like, ex and was like, great, scratch that off the list. Wow. Very consciously. Um, was obsessed with Eddie Izzard. Would watch them constantly, their specials. I have memorized, like specials, <laughs> word for word memorized. And didn't identify that as stand-up. Was just like, I don't know what that is. It's awesome. Yeah. I love it don't know what it what's going on there um and then did improv in college i've always felt i think like in high school uh i i i lost probably like almost 40 pounds in the pandemic and look pretty different than how i like you know a little bit not different at all a little bit very yeah. different whatever i'm somewhere in that range um and also and like started straightening my hair and whatever I, like i basically like i came into myself as a, a as a like 28 29 year old 30 year old as an adult and so as a teenager as like a weird pudgy loser awkward virgin didn't take my shirt off in high school teenager marching band speech and debate theater gifted and talented courses took math a year up since I was in sixth grade, like dweeb dork loser had to learn in high school how to replace. I wasn't hot. So I had to be funny, you know, like, and also I have a huge thing on my face. I have a giant birthmark, which I forget about and people who know and love me forget about, but like that's how, impacts how I interact with the world. And so being like, I don't want to just be birthmark girl. I want to be, loud girl I want to be funny girl I want to be smart girl I want to be whatever I want I want to be like look see me not mm -hmm. just the thing on my face or not just like that I'm a weird dork well I one you called yourself so many nice things in that answer <laughs> that was incredible self-love um so that's <laughs> great yeah, for your yeah, mental yeah, health yeah, yeah, yeah. um you did bring it up and, and I loved your show because 
it is like you are vulnerable. Like you're right. Like the birthmarks there, people are going to see it. You've dealt with that your whole life. And I have to imagine as a young kid, when did you realize not to get too serious? It is a mental health show. Yeah, but yeah. when did you realize we've already, I've already brought up Bill Cosby. Get as serious yeah, as you want. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> my bad. Um, when did you realize that you were, I hate saying it this way, but different than other kids? Oh, I think before I can remember. I mean, I truly like, I have had this for my entire life. There is no escaping that. Like I've had people be like, oh, you have something on your face. What is that? I've, I have strangers touch it. I've had multiple strangers kiss it or lick it in bars. Like over the years, that's probably happened like, three or four times but like three or four times over a lifetime Yikes. of a stranger walking up to you and like kissing a thing on your face licking a thing I mean it's crazy yeah. I have people touch it without asking all the time like and that's happened my whole life I think actually one of the I'm bad at comebacks um I'm an only child so I didn't have siblings to practice on but also like I made the decision early I don't even know if consciously but like I, ch I chose the path young 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 to not like be shitty back to somebody about my birthmark but just when somebody says whatever insane shit i get all the time right. i just would say oh it's a birthmark i've had it my whole life and and some version of that you know and um i think that i like that was a path that I, it's like when you look different enough you have to either you you have to either be uh fine with it, like step around whatever the otherness is, yeah. whatever the difference is and be like, no, I'm going to still be like positive and hold my head high and you're going to interact with me. Not the thing that's weird. Yeah. Or you can let it sour you and really make you bitter and feel different and feel outside. Yeah. And I really probably just credit my parents, my mom, absolutely. And like, Help, you know, creating an environment that led me to choose the more positive route. Well, I was going to say as a kid, I mean, like we're the same age or around that same time. Like I'm, like, I'm very young. Yeah. Okay. Me too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you have to have a lot of strength as a kid to do that, especially like we went to school with no cell phones. Yeah, it was yeah. like what happened at school happened at school. I can't imagine life like now. And I'm sure like you still get comments, people saying bullshit on the internet. But back then, how did you have that strength and awareness? You mentioned your parents, which I'm sure had a great influence on the way that you handled. But like, I could guess most kids wouldn't handle that well. And they would deal with some type of anxiety, depression as a kid. Yeah, I don't, it's, I think the credit really, really goes to my mom. I don't even know like specifically what strategies I had about like handling stuff about my birthmark. Also, I think a part of it is like, I di we didn't move from, like we moved into the house that I grew up in when I was five mm. and I lived there throughout all of high school. So like there is a degree of, with the birthmark specifically, like when I think after five minutes it goes away, yeah. you know, or, or however long. Uh, I, I say that because I've had a lot of people, say, I've had hundreds of people say that to me throughout my life. Yeah. So I think that there's a degree of like, Kids at school were like, oh, yeah, that's Chloe. They weren't like, that's birthmark girl. Every once in a while, if somebody was, if somebody wanted to be mean, they would pull it out. That's when, basically, it's like uh, once, you know, maybe at the beginning of the year when I'm meeting new kids, there was like weird reactions. But yeah. then people got used to it. But it was when somebody like wanted to twist the knife that they would be like, well, at least I don't have a thing on my face or whatever, you know, more, more mean version of it yeah. was. And that's when it would get, that's when it would get tough. But my, I think beyond my birthmark the the way so my parents are hippies and like hippie hippie hippies like okay. met at a transcendental meditation teacher training course down the rabbit hole hippies oh um and when i but i grew up with just my mom i'm very very close with both of them but i grew up with just my mom and my mom would set aside uh pro we would have processing time since before i can remember Bef like I don't know, two, three, uh, processing time, which is like time for me to process my feelings. If I'm sad, what am I sad about? If I'm, mm. you know, scared, what am I scared about? Whatever. And we would talk it through. And if, and we would like talk about this thing that was uncomfortable that, you know, is a topic that I don't want to deal with it because it makes me like, I have such memories of dealing with this when I was a little, little, little kid. Yeah. You know, Holly didn't invite me to her birthday party and I feel sad and hurt about that and this is a topic that you don't want to deal with because it's painful to deal with and we would sit on the couch and we would 
talk about Holly didn't invite me to her birthday party and I feel sad about that. And eventually I would cry. Like eventually we would, it would like, you know, it's like you like peel back the layers far enough yeah. that I would sob, process the feelings. My mom would talk about like the hardest thing in the world to do. The scariest thing in the world as a human is to feel a bad feeling yep. is to like sit in that bad feeling and mm -hmm. walk through it and like get through the, the fire to the other side, yeah. not go around it, not shut it down, not, but like be in it, face it, like, yeah. Dive head first. Into yeah. It. Stand in it. And, but then you get through and like, I knew I like, I always, I would cry until I would yawn. Like suddenly in the middle of sobbing, I would have a big yawn and that would be like, Oh, that is the end of it. That is, or, or that is like the end of this part of it. Yeah. Um, and my mom taught me that like, we, we would have, if I, if I like couldn't do it because I had play practice at the time, you know, I'm like sad right now, but I have to go to play practice. My mom would say, make a promise to your higher self that you will come back to this feeling and you will deal with it and you will process it, but you can't right now because you have play practice. And I would go, I make a promise to my higher self. I will, but I have play practice. And then the next day we would sit down on the couch and have processing time and we would have hot chocolate after. And like, it was this, I mean, it's like this incredible, that is why I am very in touch with my emotions because mm -hmm. of that pattern that my mom set up. When I was a kid, I remember being in high school and being like, oh, every negative emotion is rooted in either fear or grief. If I'm mad, what am I scared of? If I'm jealous, what am I sad about? If I'm like fear and grief are the, to me, the absolute core roots. Right. And I was 15 when I came to that conclusion. I mean, your mom is an angel. Yeah. She's in <laughs> is incredible. Did you, was she a therapist or this is just where like, that is such a thing of beauty to like have those moments and like. You probably thought growing up, oh, everyone does this. And you realize we're the only ones that no, do this. No, I knew that we okay, were you weird. Did? Okay. I, felt, I mean, that's like part of what made me feel weird as a kid was that like I grew up in this hippie household that I knew was very different than everybody else's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I was talking about the processing time. Like just that is so unique, I guess. But when you're growing up with it, probably in the moment you're like, okay, we do this. This is our I thing. I think I was always aware of like – everything that went on in our house was different than everything that went okay. on in someone else's house. Well, that's a unique perspective because like you mentioned the birthmark being unique, the, your parents unique, your household unique. Did that give you like any type of self-consciousness throughout not just high school, oh, but like going into your real life too? Completely self-conscious in high school. Um, About what? Just being different and not our house didn't look how it was supposed to look and yeah. I didn't, we didn't have the same amount of money that somebody else had. And right. Oh, just feeling like a weirdo outcast. I think a lot of people now are like, I think I'm like f fairly good socially. Doing well so far. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think a lot of people are like, there's no way you were such a weirdo in high school. And it's like, Oh no, no. I felt like a real, real, real outsider. Huh. Um, but then in college, I started to figure out that it's cooler to be different and yes. that it's like cooler to be more interesting Yep. and that to be, to like fit the mold is so fucking boring. Yep. Rather be weird and different than normal. That's how I look yes. at it. But it took me a while to get to that point. Like totally. I, I played sports, but then I also did drama dance. Yeah. Like it was just like uh, my, I'll never forget like getting called gay at school for like dancing. And then one of my buddies, Sh Sean said, he's going to hang out with like 40 girls after school. You guys are going to baseball practice. Fuck you guys. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. actually you're right. Yeah. Sweet. Um, nothing ever worked out with them, but it was yeah, cool. It was, yeah, yeah. it was a cool thing to bring up. Um, now when you go from high school, to, where'd you go to college at? You said you studied Gustavus Adolphus college. Is that a real place? Is <laughs> that an online It is school? not online. It is, um, a small, pretty medium school in the, on the plains of Southern Minnesota. I love it so much. It like made me who I am in so many ways. Okay. Um, I had never heard of that. And I'm yeah. like a sports reporter. So I'm like, what mascot is it? What sports do they play? We are the gusties. I guess it's a lion. Uh, yeah, it's, a, I think. I <laughs> or don't wind. I don't, like, I mean, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like, Gusty's blow, whatever the fuck. Anyway, <laughs> it's, all, it's all that. It was like, it's like an incredibly middle of the road college that I love so much. And it's like, w when I, 
became able to donate money, I was like, oh, the only two places I'm donating money are Gustavus and Planned Parenthood because those two places have like made my life so, so, so much better in so many ways. So for you, you did you, I think you told me before, were you a math major? Mm -hmm. Okay, so like nerd. Nerd, um, dork, dweeb. I took math a year up starting in sixth grade. I'm such so a- you, So you were met for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I finished Calc 3 in high school. Okay. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a loser. <laughs> I look this is all about helping your mental health so I'm not going to say that but if you say it sure um but you had, so like comedy still at that point wasn't like a career option for you no it wasn't a career option for so long didn't feel like a I like look back and I'm like oh this career is what I always knew that I wanted and what I always had a sense existed and I didn't have any framework for it I didn't have any way of locating like ah uh, somebody can work in the entertainment industry. I was like, I know that I want to be performing and I know that I want to, I know that I'm good like socially and that I want that to be a part of my job, part of my life. But like, I don't know. Yeah. I was like, I guess I want to be an actor and I still would like to act way more than I am. Yeah. Um, but I didn't, yeah, I didn't have the, I totally didn't have the framework for comedy. So what gave you the I almost said the balls, but the courage to like step away from that normal job and start chasing this because stand up comedy early on is fucking horrific. Yes. Well, Target headquarters laid off two thousand people in one day, and I was one of them. Oh, congrats! <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, and uh, I had spent coming out of college. I, I I had this like job offer at Target because I had interned there because. A family friend had like in so many words been like, if you don't get a good corporate internship, you'll never get a good job. And if you don't get a good job, you'll die an early death. And I was like, great, I guess I'm going to get an internship. <laughs> and and then Target offered me this job after after it. And I was like, OK, I'll take I don't have anything else to do. I'll take this good paycheck. I'll and and I think once I was there, I was like, OK, maybe because I, I had done improv in college. OK, yeah, there was we had an, we had an improv troupe, you know, like every college does. And yeah. our improv troupe was like sweet and sometimes great and sometimes dog shit and whatever. <laughs> um, and so I was like, I'll go. But I had heard of Second City in Chicago. Yeah, one of the best, if not the best totally. improv place. Totally. And I was like, okay, I'm going to work at Target for a year and I'm going to bank a ton of money. I was living with my mom. So I was like, I'm saving a shit ton of money yeah. and I uh, then I'll quit after a year and I'll go to Chicago. And then like the problem is it's really easy to – uh, do a job that you're pretty good at and makes you what feels like a shit ton of money at the time. Right. Uh, and so then I was there for two years and I was like, after two years, I'm going to quit. And then I'm going to, and then I moved, I was in like business analytics that my math major had got me there, but I competed in speech and debate for 10 years. And so I used that to weasel over to executive communications and I was an executive speech writer at oh, Target. Wow. And then I was like, well, I'll be in communications for a year. So I have that on my resume. So I have it on my, like, I like wasn't, you know, I just wasn't leaving. And then I got laid off and I'm so grateful that that happened because so, I would have been there for a lot longer. So losing your job gave you no choice but to chase that dream then? Uh, I certainly did still have a choice. Those, the two months after losing that job were so scary uh, and I was real. I got really, really, really invested in two specific other corporate jobs that were like more creative ish, yeah. but still were corporate. Like a, there was like a video producer at the Atlantic and then some other, some marketing firm in Chicago that like does comedy that uses comedy in marketing and both corporate jobs that, that were more creative. And I was like, these jobs are the only thing that I can do in my entire life. Just, like super, 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 it was really resisting just doing comedy mm. because it's so scary. It's yeah. so scary to not have a framework. It's so scary to not, to like, to be like, it's just me. I'm the only, it's, uh, it's, there's, there's nothing else. There's no, there's not a business. It's not, there, there's no people helping me. It is just you. Yeah. It's, and also it's very personal where it's like, it's not just, it's only me, uh, like being the engine of of the career and moving forward and there's no deadlines and I just have to set my own deadlines and I have to set my own goals but also it's like if I fail if I bomb yeah it's so personal it's like it's not like they didn't like my painting it's like oh they didn't like me right <laughs> they saw me when for you're a few minutes and they're telling you're, you're telling your story your vulnerability and I think probably at least early in your career I still saw you do it you know two three nights ago here but like you have to address the elephant in the room and make that part of your story 
At least I would think, right? You mean my birthmark? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. For sure. I, I still, I mean, like, it's only been within the last year, year and a half that I've started doing sets where I don't talk about it at all. Every once in a while I do that. And now it'll be like, I'll get halfway through a set. Like, I'll get, maybe not halfway through a set, but I'll get, like, pretty deep into a set and be like, oh, I have to tell you about the thing on my face, by the way. And now I am so so present in myself when I am on stage or 99% of the time that I think people are just like, okay, whatever. We'll just go with her. Right. That there is a degree of like confidence and leading somebody down a path. They are willing to just follow and be like, I'm going to trust you, but you have to, I, as a performer, I have to establish that trust. I have to be like, you can b- believe, believe me. Yeah. Just come with me. On well, where, when did that confidence start? Because open mic comedy horror stories, like, did you start in New York and bounce around there? Or how did, I started in Minneapolis. Um, oh, wow, okay. I thought I was going to move to Chicago. And my mom, I was like, I'm going to, yeah, that's what I'll do. And my mom was like, what if you do one class here and one open, like one improv class and one stand up open mic? Just fucking see, try yeah. it here. And then if you want to move in three months, you can move to Chicago. But like, what if you just start here? And you killed. And I started in Minneapolis. I had a good first set, but it's also, I competed in speech and debate for 10 years. Yeah. And I always, speech and improv and theater, I always picked speech over improv and theater huh. if they ever conflicted. And I knew that there was grown up theater. And I think theater people are broadly speaking annoying. And I <laughs> knew that there was, and so I didn't go into that. And I knew that there was grown up improv and that's what I thought I was going to do. And I, I was like, there's no grown up speech. There's no adult version of the thing that I love the most. Huh. And then I found stand up and I was like, ah, this, this is, is the closest. It. This is, uh, I'm writing for myself. I'm editing my own writing. I'm in a lineup. I'm timed. I'm dealing with time signals. I'm like, I have to deal with something weird that's going on in the room. I, you know, there's all, all of those corollary skills. The writing itself is different, but those corollary skills really feed into it. So I had a good first open mic. And as first open mic. So stuff. what gave you then the idea of, hey, I'm going to move to New York and really go at this thing 110 that, miles an hour? You know, it's funny. So I, the, the like moving to New York, I think is that was a little bit farther down the line. But the thing that made me, I, what, what, the answer I'm going to give is the thing that made me be like, oh, I'm not going to quit. Um, I, about a year and a half, a uh, year-ish into doing stand-up, it's like very common for stand-ups to go to another, out of a small scene, go to another small scene and like meet other comics and right. whatever. And I happened, I did a week in Seattle because I had something else that was out in Seattle and I just was like, fuck it, I'll do a week of comedy there. And you submit to all their like bar shows and yeah. you get to do it because you're an out-of-towner and there's, you know, you're, you're whatever. An exciting new addition to, to a scene that doesn't have a lot of turnover. Um, and my very first night, I was like closing, I was doing the 10 minute booked spot on an open mic at the end of an open mic, which is like, you know, now absolutely fucking nothing, but like felt like a big deal at the time. And, um, a guy who wound up getting weird later in the week, but, uh, he, that night, um, afterward he was like, well, when are you moving to New York or LA and which are you moving to? And I was like, oh, I don't know. I guess if I, I guess if I don't quit stand up, I guess I'll have to figure out, I guess I'll move it eventually. And he was like brusque about it. And he, and he, he was like, look, fuck that you or in what, in so many words, he was like, you are good enough to not quit. You are good enough to make this your career. If you think you're going to quit, then fucking quit, quit right now. Stop wasting other people's time. Stop taking stage time from people who don't want to quit. Stop wasting your own time, sure, whatever. Yeah. But like, mostly, don't waste other people's time. And if, but but I think you shouldn't quit, and I think you should commit to this. And I needed that. I needed to hear that. And the fact that like he got weird a little bit later, eh, whatever. I really, really, really needed that kind of like shake of the shoulders. And I that night I was like, oh great, I'm not gonna quit. I'm gonna do this for real. And you moved to New York what a month later. Uh, yeah, it was, it, it took, it took another probably two years to, wow. before I moved, but yeah, that's just like, it's but such that a, was the, like mind like the move was not the big thing. The mindset that, shift was yeah. the big thing. That's where like, I mean, our stories are different, but like kind of career self motivator doing your own thing is similar. It's like, I remember when I quit drinking, when I started this like six months in I go, Hey, you can't keep fucking doing this. You have to decide to like go all in. Or go find a corporate job since you're not on TV anymore. Yeah. And so that helped me the most. Um, so when did it start like 
feeling better and, and you move to New York and you start, I mean, like you're touring the country now, being able to support yourself. This isn't just like a hobby. This is your career now yeah. as a comedian. When did that flip switch for you? Um, I think, I mean, I moved to New York in 2018 and then I got hired at the Tonight Show at the very, very end of 2019, in December of 2019. Um, and... That I mean, like to be hired at the Tonight Show within a year and a half of moving to New York is is oh, is a huge. fast yeah it's a fast turnaround, and that um, you know it, it comedy is the kind of thing where like you make zero money until you make an absolutely mind blowing amount right. of money, and I was only at the Tonight Show for nine months. I was only there for three. The cycles are thirteen weeks, and at the end of every thirteen weeks, they can renew your contract or they can fire you. Wow! And I was only there for three cycles. I say a year to just like round make it, it easier, up to whatever, yeah. but like. Um, I got fired as everybody does at that show. Um, and that's a whole other, that like, that's a whole other story. But the, um, that was probably that, that, you know, that was the first time that I was like seriously making money from comedy where it was like that, that is my job and that is my only job. Yeah. Um, but I think I probably didn't actually feel like my career was beginning like I really was like, oh, this is the be this is the beginning of a career in the entertainment industry until um so I left I left the Tonight Show in 2020. Then at the very end of 2021, I fell ass backwards into selling a movie off a of verbal pitch. I don't have a screenwriting background. I'm not a movie guy. I never dated a movie guy. I like I I ac very accidentally sold a movie and I and the it's one of the you know it's a, a very happy accident. Um, and that still didn't feel like, okay, this is fully my career. I think I was like starting to feel like that. And then after that, I got staffed in a writer's room for a Steven Soderbergh miniseries. And out of that miniseries, out of that writer's room, I then got cast as one of the leads in that miniseries. Mm. And th somewhere in there, I started to be like, oh, damn, this is my career actually for real. Right. And that, and, and it's, you know, important to note for me, at least that like, that is the entertainment industry side of the comedy career. That's not the stand up side of the comedy, like tonight show movie. Yeah. They're writers two different room, things. acting. Uh, and all of that is Hollywood. That is not stand up. Right. And I have spent the last three years, like speaking of mental health stuff, I have spent the last three years comparing myself only to people only to my peers in stand-up and they have spent the last three years doing this in stand-up and only in stand-up and i've spent the last three years doing this in the rest of the entertainment industry yeah and doing this every once in a while in stand-up yeah and so my stand-up career looks very very different than theirs and i have i've spent so long feeling so bad that my stand-up career doesn't look like my friends who three years ago were my very direct peers and that like that has been a big I have really 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 had to chew on that especially in the last year so you now I'm going to dig into that answer because it is like a big mental health thing seeing other people succeed around you like I watch the guys that like I have friends that are on ESPN or like literally on NBC yeah. news. And it's so weird to me because I'm like, Oh, that could have been me. Or I thought that was going to be me yeah. for you to like have people that you're doing shows with or going to the comedy cellar with and doing these different things. And you're growing, you're growing, you're growing. And all of a sudden you see them make it all the way here. Yes. And then you're still climbing, climbing, climbing that takes a big toll on you. And how, how did it affect you? How did you not like just sink into, Oh, I'm never going to make it when they're way ahead of me now. I will say I have for probably two years, realistically fought really, really hard in the, I'm never going to make it. Like I absolutely have, I have so many days, so many weeks, so many months where I'm like, Oh, I don't look, my career doesn't look like that. And I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna have a career. And what's crazy, what I know is crazy is that like, there's so many standups who would give half of their road dates to have written two drafts of a movie for a major studio for a studio that like when the title card comes up, you know what title card that is. Like, right. 
so, there's so many stand-ups who would give their apartment to have worked with Steven Soderbergh. And I'm like, I don't even have a career because I can't sell, you know, 2,000 tickets in Boston or whatever the fuck. Like, it's it's funny that the, like, you see your pals at NBC or ESPN and you're here. It's... I. It's the inverse. Like, I am the person at NBC or ESPN, but I'm not on TV yet. Right. I'm, like, right I, – I'm, like, the second level or the – not – no, the hundredth level, whatever. But, like, I basically am, like, building a career over here where I'm trying to get on NBC or ESPN. Yeah. And I'm looking at the U's and being, like – I don't have a fucking podcast. I'm worthless. I'm useless. There, there's not. I don't have like a tractor beam between me and my fan base. There are people who are like, "Where can I go to get my stuff from Chloe?" I don't, and I'm like, "I don't know. I don't because I'm busy writing a movie script, so I can't manage huh. the time to put out a podcast every week." Except that's the model of success that our industry, that like the stand up social media side now exists in. So right. I'm like, uh, uh, I, I, I should be doing that." And my friends are like. I wish I had that. The, I think the I think the reason that the like, but your friends haven't sold a movie and you sold a movie, doesn't make me feel better or didn't for a very long time, is that um, a lot of my friends don't want to. Have, so as much as I'm saying like a lot of my friends would give up half their tour dates to have sold a movie, uh, a lot of them actually wouldn't though. A lot of them yeah. are like, all I want to do is stand up. up. That is my whole life. That is what I want to do forever. And they are doing that. And that kind of like, that kind of focus and putting those jets against one thing is, I think that has probably been the the meat of my like mental health struggle uh, over the last year is being like, do I want to put my jets behind one singular thing or do I want more, do I want uh, not more like, bigger more like more things right than my fr best friends who just want stand-up and i think the answer is i think i want more multiple things right which means i have to work on multiple things which means i'm not going to be in the same place right. as those people and that navigation is it takes a lot i burn a lot of brain calories trying to figure out is it worth it in this or should i focus on stand up. I mean like do you still struggle with that day to day do you like I'm just gonna throw scenarios out there yeah I do this where I'll scroll and see like a different show than mine I'm like wow my guests are better the content's better the conversation's better but somehow this is getting 10 times as many views or downloads do you look at like other comedians see their sets and like go wow like I know that I can do this that I can be as big as they are I have the material I have the comedy like do you compare and contrast still to this day where you're sitting in bed scrolling? Totally. 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. And it hurts your mental health doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very bad. Um, yeah, totally. I, it's, I, I, when I'm comparing, I'm not like, how are they so big and how am I not? It's not that. I, because I, it, I'm like, dang, the, the, the core thing that I beat myself up about is, am I putting... 40% effort into four careers or 30% effort. You say that into math's four. not right. But. I know. Well, but I think I, I, th I mean, I do think I work oh, very 120? hard. Like 120. Yeah. Okay. So like, I, am I putting 30% effort into four careers and they are putting a hundred, they are putting all 120% of their effort into one career. And am I fucking up? I, I'm saying I am doing that. And am I fucking up by making that decision? Because if I was putting 120% into only stand up and social media, which yeah. is this huge, which is a more than a full time career, right. if I if my whole job was just to review my own tape, not and this is not a just, yeah. was to review my own tape, put out three clips a week, have a podcast that also puts out more clips a week, have a Patreon that puts out special bonus episodes, and I and if I put my jets for three years behind that. I don't know that I would have the exact same success as somebody else. I can't guarantee that. Right. But I know that I would have way more success in that area than I do right now. But I would not have a solo show that I signed a TV development deal on where like maybe I'll get to make a TV show right. off of the IP that I created that is my own solo show that is not the hour of stand-up that I do on the road that is a completely separate solo show that is about huh. something incredibly vulnerable and incredibly bare and, and that I have people come up to me and be like, 
holy shit, I didn't know anybody else felt like that. And you said everything that's on the inside of my brain, that solo show. And now I have a deal. And also there's this movie that like probably will never get made, but what if it does, that would be amazing. And what, and all this other shit. And like, I'm auditioning a bunch and I haven't gotten cast in shit, but I'm a better auditioner now than my stand up pals who might get tossed one a month. Right. And they're not good at auditioning because it's a skill because they're spending their time doing this other skill. It's like, it's, it's none of it is bad, but the question that I constantly wrestle with is, am I making the wrong decision in terms of how I manage my career and in terms of how, where I am putting the jets and if I were to put all of the fuel behind one, would that be better than spreading my eggs between baskets? And at this point, I just, the decision has been made for me. I am too far with all of these projects right. to walk away from it. Now, I, if I had gone into college having finished Calc 3 in high school and not been a math major, it would have been a fucking waste of time. Like it would have, there was a little bit of a like, you've come this far in math. Hey, moron, just do the rest of your fucking math major because why, because you're this close, you're just this close. And I have a couple projects where it's like, I'm not actually this close to making, I'm not this close to making a TV show. I'm not, but it is like, you're, you're far enough in that it's worth finishing this. Right. It's worth seeing it through. Chloe and I have joked a lot about our own struggles, vulnerability, kind of poking fun at ourselves. But as you heard us both say, you have to be comfortable just being you and embrace sometimes the weird or what people might make fun of you for. You just have to be your truest self. And a lot of us sometimes struggle with that feeling. I know I did. I had to go to therapy. So did Chloe because we just maybe didn't know how to take care of our mental health. And there's a lot of people just like us. And for all the men out there listening, I know sometimes it can be scary being vulnerable, but that's why I want you to go to mantherapy.org. Man Therapy has this amazing 18-point head inspection. It's a quick two-minute test that asks you everyday basic questions about life, work, your mental, your physical health to help you the best with your emotions, with finding that true self and finding out how to be the best version of yourself. Again, that is mantherapy.org. All the men out there, go out and check it out. It's an amazing resource at mantherapy.org. Suicide can be tough to talk about, but that's why The Happiness Project is helping us break the stigma. After losing their classmate, Nick, his friends knew they had to do something to help save lives. So, The Happiness Project was born, a clothing brand to raise awareness for mental health and suicide prevention with t-shirts and hoodies to start a conversation and let people know, just like you, you are not alone. To learn more, follow at Happiness Project on social media and use the code MENTALGAME at happinessproject.com for 15% off your first order. So you're trying to figure out your own identity even to yourself and yeah. like what you want to pick, but yeah. also like that has to weigh on you too. Like I, I know that you had been to therapy in the past, but like even you have to deal with that stuff now. Like oh, how, yeah. How do you wrestle that in your head? I, like, I, I don't think you're going to therapy right now. I'm not in therapy right okay, now. Okay, no. uh, we talk a little bit off camera, so we know stuff th before the episode, but how do you handle that like in a positive way like, and not go into a sinkhole of, what the fuck am I doing right oh now? Oh, my God. Sinkhole is, has been a lot of how I've handled it. All right, um, well, don't do that anymore, please. I know, I know. <laughs> Honestly, so first of all, I journal constantly. Um, my phone background, I wish it's over there, but I'll, I'll, it, my phone background says is just, it says document everything. And that is, if it is in your brain, put it in the fucking phone, put it in your notes app. My notes app is yeah. uh, not crazy. It's like, I have thousands and thousands of notes and I have so many folders. I have so many files. Wow. It's so filed, but I have a journal folder and I just, it's like, j I stream of consciousness dump constantly to just like bloodlet the poison. Mm. Um, but a big thing that I've dealt with recently is, or a big, th like a corner that I've turned in the last year, year and a half is like, th there is a degree of, Hey, Radcliffe snap out of it. Like the reason that I am like, Hey moron over here, come on, come on, come on. Yeah. is like, I like that kind of, obviously I like that kind of self-talk. Self you've yeah. heard, you've heard me be like, Hey, dipshit. Yeah. You gotta make this not a big deal. Like you gotta drop it. You gotta let it go. Mm -hmm. And I wish that I had somebody outside of myself to say that, but it has to be me. Um, 
And I like, there is a lot of like, you just have, I think I've done enough, um, like validate the negative feelings, you know, like tell yourself, like validate that it's okay to be scared and it's okay to be mad and it's okay to be jealous and it's okay to be whatever short. And yes, it is. And also like at some point you have to be like, and now you have to put that on a shelf and you have to see it positively. Yep. Like it's a, it's a conscious choice. I think I spent my whole life learning how to like be in touch with my emotions and now I have to take the next step and like replace that with a positive view. Yeah. Well, you're, which is much easier said than, Oh yeah. I mean, it took me forever. Like I check into a mental hospital. I learn all these things. I still drink. I wasn't like taking my medicine. Like you, it takes you a while to, to learn those things and adapt. Um, you mentioned before the vulnerability on stage and how it can help other people. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that just a little bit? Because I think there's vulnerability, obviously, with your birthmark and other people that can relate to just people looking at them a certain way, but also your solo show that you do, it is really, really vulnerable and it can help people. How, how did you feel comfortable being that vulnerable on stage and how does it help you? Um, it took, so the solo show is about how I have a history of cheating in a lot of my relationships. Um, and I say for the record, cheating is always bad. It always hurts somebody. I, the solo show does not condone cheating at all, but I do think it happens all the time and nobody ever talks about it and not talking about it doesn't make it go away. And I think that if we wanted, I think I sort of see it as, as a parallel or on the same family tree as addiction where it's like, if we wanted something like this to stop, we would want people to talk about it. That's how you break a stigma. That's how you end an, uh, an addiction. Yes, exactly. So that, so that's what the solo show is. Um, and I, I went into it being like, Oh, I'm really good at being vulnerable. I'm so in touch with why I make the decisions I make and whatever. And then I developed the show for six months and it took me, I mean, I, now I've been doing the show for a year and a half basically. And, um, I, I, the, but those first six months, it took me months to be able to say the hard things and to be able to say like shit that may, I mean, just saying I have cheated a bunch automatically makes me unlikable. I know that, especially as a woman, I think from a man, people are like, it, 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 people are like, oh, I fucking knew it, but it's also sort of like more expected and like good women are not supposed to have desires like that and whatever. There's a, that's a whole other conversation. Anyway come see the show. Um, (laughs) but, uh, like just saying that automatically makes me unlikable, but there's like so many more layers of unlikable, but honest realities that are involved with a behavior pattern like that. Yeah. Um, and it took me a long, long, long time to be able to be willing to say some of the like darkest, most dangerous stuff. Um, but I kept, before I was saying the dangerous stuff, I would leave the show and people would be like, hey, funny show. And I was like, Ugh, that's not the reaction that I think right. this show should be getting that I think I'm capable of as a performer and as a writer that I think the material like should be eliciting. And then I started to say the more dangerous stuff and people would be like, Chloe, what you have done, you know? But it's that like, we all have dangerous opinions and habits and behaviors and mindsets and uh like we are all sort of magneted toward some very dark thing yeah what we all i i call it to me it's like i have i i had this and whatever hope to i'm now in a very happy very monogamous relationship with a person who saw this show before we started dating and we talk about we talk about relationship stuff all the time. We talk yeah. about like electricity with another person all the time. We, it's like very, very open and it's the healthiest relationship I've ever been in. The relationship's not open. The the way you guys talk. Correct. 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 Exactly. <laughs> no, the relationship is like very closed. Um, <laughs> although I do, people hear that I have this whole show and men are like, well then she's not off limits. And I'm like, fuck off. Yes, I am. Anyway. Um, but the, uh, wait, wait, what was I? Um, the vulnerability on stage, feeling comfortable oh, oh, getting oh. dark. We uh, Yes, in the show, I talk about, like, I have a thing inside of me and that in in all of these past relationships, I would just put the thing in a cage and throw a blanket over the cage and hope that it goes to sleep. And it always did for a while. And then eventually it would wake up Yep. sooner or later. And every time I just kept being, like, back in the cage, throw a blanket over it and hope. Just hope that this time it doesn't wake up. 
And I think that everybody has some thing in their cage. It might not be, it doesn't have to be cheating. It can, they can be completely monogamous, not have a problem with that at all. Yeah. Everybody has something like that. And I think that to be honest about, I think that, I think that I, uh, art is to reflect life back to people. Any, any form of art is to make people feel seen and to make people be able to examine themselves in a way that is like, it lets it gives them a, a conduit outside of themselves to be, to look back at themselves, so that they don't just have to sit there in fucking therapy and be like, "And why do I feel sad about myself?" You know, like watching art like lets you externalize that those kind of feelings, and or experiencing art. And I think that that's the more vulnerable, the more people are able to identify something that is in themselves. That would be, it's like the scarier the thing that yeah. I'm identifying, the scarier the thing that they're identifying, which means it's the rarer opportunity for them to identify it in themselves. Well, it sounds like you, I'm not assuming anything here, just, this, yeah, is, yeah, my, this, is, my, this is my mini therapy session with yeah, you. Yeah, 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 I love it. You're, this is you unpacking trauma from past relationships that you had never unpacked before and you're doing it. And trauma a, that I'm, I've inflicted. <laughs> oh, that too, yes. Yeah, yeah. Through a therapeutic way of writing this show like that seems like this was like huge for you to just finally unpack all this shit. totally and i think that that's not not an insignificant reason of why my current relationship is why i am able to be so much healthier in this relationship is having done this show because i then spent months 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 like every day thinking about my own bad patterns yeah so that i could then say it to an audience um, yeah, totally. No, I, I feel like I, I'm not a different person after doing this show, having done the show, but like, I have a very different view of myself and my own patterns in a way that I thought I was like, I know everything. I fucking, I journal all the time. I, my mom and I did processing time. I'm so in touch with why I do the things I do. And now, and then like did the show and I was like, Oh, oh, oh I had not realized a bunch of shit. You didn't unpack it yet. Yeah. Can I ask you a very direct question? That's of like I will see. I, you might yeah. tell me to fuck off. Yeah, let's see. Why do you think you cheated so much? It. You should come see the show. <laughs> That's I guess, kind of the whole point. I of the know. Show. All right. Well, then I'll have to figure it out. <laughs> um, it's a it, the the short version is, um, I wish, and I I talk about this in the show. I wish that I had a like one big reason. I wish that I was the like loose cannon cop with nothing to lose and his wife got murdered and that's why he can now do bad things and we can we can understand why he does bad things because he's sad. It's not I don't think that's how real yeah. people are. Um even like Fleabag is a show that like made such a massive impact on me. I love it so much. I think it's one of the greatest TV shows ever made. Um and in that show, the character has this, like, she is behaving badly because her mom died and then she feels responsible for her friend's death. Mm. Sorry, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen this <laughs> show from seven years ago. Um, and it's like, those are two incredibly clear narrative reasons that we can, like, pin and be like, that's why this bad person does bad things. And I just do not fuck and think that that's how most people operate and I actually think that pr the majority of people who go through some like massive trauma if they can come out the other side wind up actually like as better wiser more grounded people yeah and that the people who behave badly are kind of like it's like I bring like here's my basket of like shitty little reasons of like a uh, relationship with my dad that in some ways is, are so is so wonderful and in some ways is really difficult and a relationship with my body where I like felt fat my entire life, but was never actually like obese so, was overweight, but was never like actually obese. So it's like, who the fuck are you to say you felt fat? Shut the fuck up. Everybody feels pudgy in high school, but also like that's still how it is, you know, like that yeah. still impacts and like thing on my face that in some ways made me feel so outside of norm normality. But in some ways I like uh, metabolized really easily it's like all of this weird, you know, and like, so I never felt like conventionally attractive to men. And then when I realized that I could like use being funny and charming and direct and kind of like edgy to get male attention, even though I felt heavy and I had a birthmark and whatever, then I was like, this is the drug that I've never been able to do before. Huh. And now I can get this external validation because I don't have this, like I'm 
good at internally validating myself on some things, but not on others. This is the, you know, like that kind of like attractiveness is what I felt like I was missing. And that, that, that. anyway, all of this, it's like, that's my weird patchwork quilt of like, what are the whys yeah. here? And also then early, the first time I cheated, I tried to break up with my boyfriend right after. And he said, no. And I, he didn't know that I was cheating. He just was like, no, let's stay together. And I was too young to know that I could walk. And so I stayed and I learned that it was easier to cheat and hide than to go through the hard thing of being like, now we have to break up. Right. I mean, it's like, but it's like, I'm this, not clipping this to make you sound like an asshole cheater. Like I just was genuinely no, 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 curious. Totally. But, I, but what I'm saying is like, it's a million and I also cut this all out so that people have to come see the show. The, like, <laughs> yeah, a, sorry. I don't, it's I'm, like a million little bad reasons, right? It's right. all, but that's like, it's like, why did you drink? Why did you, why were you an addict? Is it because you're, you know, you had a, like a family member do one big bad or like, because you were in a big tragic car accident when you were a kid? Probably not. No. Probably it's a bunch of weird, little stupid, shitty reasons yeah. that all should be manageable, right. but they coalesce into whatever this, like, hard nut of shame is yeah. inside of you and then you're like i don't want to do that i want to do this other thing that feels way better and that i've learned how to make work most critically i have learned how to make this this bad system work and not implode my life i call it autopilot that's yeah. what, that's what i did totally. for eight years where i would go out i wasn't in relationships but i would go out hammer hook up that's it. Repeat, rinse, or rinse, repeat. Yep. Do it again the next weekend. Yep. And it's just because you get used to being in that and it feels like normal to you. And then when you take your step back and you realize, oh, wait, I shouldn't be doing this. And that's mm -hmm. when you wake up and have that moment where you're able to take that step forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you do a, an amazing job of verbalizing that. And I hope that wasn't like a, it wasn't a jab question. No, 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 not at all. No, 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 no. I just am an intense person. <laughs> yeah. I, you change voices, facial patterns, like the whole interview, which I think is hilarious. That's funny. I know we've kept you a long time. And also I'm like, the one thing, it's funny, the thought that I'm having is like, it's such a bummer for my exes that I couldn't get to this place. before. like, I am sorry that they dealt with the person that I was then. Yeah. Which is in many ways the same person, but like with a more limited view, right? And it's like, I wish that they could deal with me or the, that they never had to. Anyway, whatever. No, I feel the same way about that too with either my ex or myself. Like it seems like to wrap it all up, like your journey throughout, you know, maybe getting made fun of with the birthmark, learning the processing thing with your mom early, all the way up to where you are now. It has been like anyone's life, a roller coaster. It can be a rocky journey going back and forth. Even you having that self doubt now, am I putting all my eggs in the right basket or yeah. am I spreading myself too thin in all these areas? Are you finally at the point where you think like, hey, I, I'm good. Like I feel confident in what I'm doing because based off of everything we've talked about over the last hour, it seems like you finally feel like you're in a good place with work, even if it's a lot and you're doing stand up and the writing and everything else relationship wise, family wise. I mean, do you feel like you're finally in a good spot that you haven't been in before? Maybe a great question. Um, it's funny. If you had caught me, if we had done this podcast three weeks ago, I would have been like, no, I feel scared every single day. And about, I think it literally was three weeks ago, um, I wrote a journal entry where I was like, I think I have to let myself want some of the things on this side, on the entertainment industry side of my career I have to let myself hope that they succeed because I have spent years being like, plan for that to fail, plan for stand up. Stand up is much more in an artist's control. It's the, the payoff is smaller. It's like, you know, small, consistent yeah. things. And you also, you still have to be consistent over in the entertainment industry and you still have to be doing, taking small steps, but like it's, you know, if you get booked on one big role over here, like your life changes overnight kind yep. of thing. Um, whereas stand up, it's not really like you can do a late night set. You can get, you can go to JFL, you can get named a whatever and your life doesn't really change overnight. It's yeah. really much more, it's much more of a, a gradual incline. Um, and right. Like if that movie were to get, uh, again, there's the chances that the movie that I wrote never gets made are 98%. But like if that movie were to get changes made, your life, 2%, it changes my life overnight. Right. And, 
so the, I, I think I have forever been like, don't hope. It's the self-sabotage, right? It's the classic, like, if you don't try, you can't fail. Mm -hmm. if, if you're standing there being like, I wonder if this door is locked for me or unlocked for me. Well, as long as I don't try it, maybe it will be unlocked. The longer I sit here and don't try the handle, huh. then it means that like there's still a possibility that it will be unlocked. And the second I try it, I'm so terrified that it's going to be locked. And I think I was like, I, I was in that and I, I guess that, that actually the door lock metaphor is now sort of like, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing metaphors a little bit here, but it's like, I was telling myself like plan for the door to be locked, plan for the projects to die, plan for everything to fail. You cannot hope because if you hope you then can be hurt mm. more, worse than if I, if I were to, if I actually put my heart into some of these projects that I have over here and they don't go, that will be a great, a deeper pain than maybe anything else I've experienced in my adult life, which I'm lucky to be able to say like that, 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 you know, that that's the biggest pain. Oh, that a project and whatever. But like, if you throw yourself into something and it dies, that is so scary, that risk. Right. And so I kept being like, no, don't put all of my heart into those things. And I think that, and at three, literally three weeks ago, I wrote a journal entry where I was like, I think I have to let myself. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you that are just listening we have this most heartfelt point of the podcast and a fly just landed on my nose landed on your nose Jeez really good Christ. um yeah i think i i think i have to um let myself hope for those things if i'm going to actually put like as much back as much of my back into those things like if i'm in a if those things are gonna work i have to think they will work you have to go for it and know that and it's so fucking scary it is it's you, you have moments of doubt throughout your entire career and i can't believe that that's like three weeks ago that you know flips where i, I and and it's not even like i i mean i've had it within those three weeks then i've still had days oh, of yeah. like what's even the point nothing's ever gonna work it's never gonna happen da, 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 da. but yeah i um three weeks ago i was like you have chloe you have to let yourself want it that's and it has like shifted where I'm at. That's I got to that point for the first time ever in my life. I think a year and a half ago, and it is completely life changing. Yeah. to feel that way. Um, thank you so much for opening up so much. The last thing I want to ask you is just advice to. Usually, I say like somebody wants to get into stand up comedy, which you can definitely give that advice to. But I think maybe more of the we've been doing a lot of laughing, but like the heartfelt kind of question would be to that. I don't know. Maybe that young girl that's feeling not comfortable with herself, whatever that means, listening in a small town in Minnesota or wherever they live that doesn't feel like they can be them true selves, what advice would you give them going through that yourself? It is so much more exciting and interesting and magnetic and compelling to interact with somebody who is different than to interact with somebody who is a person you've met before. Mm. And that, like, a, I think any individual has so much more magnetism when they're in touch with the things that make them strange or different than the people around them. Yep. And it's like, you know, inter like laws of attraction stuff, like you will attract so much more... Uh, energy in whatever way people career success whatever yeah just self-confidence if you are willing to like fully embrace whatever the weird thing is so embrace the weird is the message yeah i guess so i guess it's just like ah you're fucking fine like you're <laughs> you know you're fine like whatever you whatever the thing that you're afraid of yeah fuck it but in a good way fuck it but in a good way yeah yeah you're fine like yeah. i want i i would love like if i could have me talk to me and be like you're fine you're, you're, you're fucking fine. Stop sure, fucking sure, sure. worrying about this. Just fucking Don't do worry it. about it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. It's thank been a you. great conversation. Um, is it Cheat? That's the, the solo show? The solo show. show is called Cheat, yeah. When and Very, where can people see it? Not at all. <laughs> yeah, no, right to the point. When, when and where can people find info on that and all your stand-up um, The next time that I'm doing the solo show is for the New York Comedy Festival. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah. That's a big deal, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm really excited. Sweet. 
Um, it's on Sunday, November 10th in New York City at Chelsea Music Hall. Um, awesome. which is an awesome venue and I'm super, super excited to be there. Sweet. Good luck with that. You have one more show in Cincinnati. You're on the road. Everyone can find that Chloe Badcliffe. Yes, with at a B. Chloe Badcliffe. Thank you so much for opening up. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We'll see everyone right back here next week on The Mental Game. And as you can tell, Chloe and I had such a fun time filming that episode. She is hilarious. Go check her out. Her name is Chloe Radcliffe on social media, Instagram, TikTok, and all that. It is Chloe Badcliffe. She is touring the country as we speak. She is so funny. Go check out her stand-up and all of her clips on socials. Again, thanks so much to Chloe Radcliffe for coming on The Mental Game. I want to thank all of you for 2024. This is, unless something crazy happens, the last episode of 2024, and it has been the best year of my life. We put out over 50 episodes now, and I've been able to tour the country. We've been able to break the stigma in 36 states with over 50,000 of you. Thank you so much for helping save my life and helping save other lives. I can't wait to see what is to come in 2025. Very, very soon, if you are watching or listening, we will be announcing a tour across the country starting in the spring of 2025. I can't wait to keep building the mental game with you. Thank you so much. I love you, and let's keep breaking the stigma right here on The Mental Game.